This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions Podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and I am your host. Coming up, we'll be looking ahead to the She Believes Cup that takes place in America from the 5th until the 11th of March. We'll look at Phil Neville's squad and the Lionesses he's chosen, which he announced on Tuesday the 18th of February. Can the girls retain the trophy they won last year? following a 2-1 win over Brazil, a 2-2 draw with hosts USA, and a 3-0 win over Japan. England wins the 2019 She Believes Cup. The US finishes in second. Congratulations, England. Now, after the games following the World Cup, you would think perhaps, mm, maybe our chances aren't so good. But that's in the past. Phil Neville and his backroom staff have had time to digest. Coming up also, we will speak with our regular Lionesses correspondent, Rich Laverty, and also a supporter who has been to the previous four editions of the tournament and can tell us what it's like over there. Now, actually, our record in the tournament is a little deceiving. Whilst we're actually second in the all-time ranking of the competition, like America, we're the only ones who've played in all previous editions. Now, we've only won four out of the 12 games we've played, drawn three and losing the other five. We do have, though, two third-place finishes. We've been runners-up once, and as I just mentioned, we have won it once before last year. And Ellen White is actually the all-time record goal scorer in the competition, with four She Believes goals. Now, this year's tournament will see the Lionesses do the most travelling they've ever done between games. Now, I know this because I've worked it out. Let me tell you that in 2016, the distance between the three venues was give or take 1,571 miles. They played in Tampa, Nashville and Florida. 2017, 323 miles. Philadelphia, New Jersey and Washington. 2018, 1,613 miles as they went between Columbus, New Jersey and Orlando. 2019, last year, saw them go 1,543 miles between Philadelphia, Nashville and Tampa. Now, this year, they are going a massive 2,698 miles. Orlando, Harrison and Frisco are the three venues this year. We will see what sort of effect that sort of travelling has on the girls as the tournament goes along. But that is certainly a long, long way to be going for three matches within five or six days. Now, they will be playing first in Orlando, Florida on the 6th of March against America. Spain and Japan will have played earlier in the day in the same stadium. It's the Explorer Stadium. Home of MLS side Orlando City and Orlando Pride from the National Women's Soccer League. Holds about 25,500 spectators and it's hosted two women's internationals before, both she Believes Games in 2018, where France beat Germany 3-0 and a Karen Bardsley own goal gave the Americans a 1-0 win over the Lionesses. Let's hope for a more positive result this time around. Now, our record against America isn't too good. Since our first meeting with them in 1985, we've met on 17 occasions, only winning four, drawing twice, and unfortunately, we've lost 11 times to them most recently in last year's World Cup semi-final in Lyon in France, where goals from Christian Press and Alex Morgan saw them go through to the final uh, and then win it. You may remember Ellen White equalised, Steph Horton missed a late penalty and Millie Bright was sent off. 
Straight after that game, pitch side, Phil Neville said he'd already moved on from that defeat and was looking forward to the third and fourth place match, which unfortunately didn't go our way. Now, two days later, March the 8th, the girls move on to Harrison, New Jersey and the Red Bull Arena, another soccer specific stadium that plays host to the New York Red Bulls and Sky Blue FC from the Women's League. Again, 25,000. The Lionesses played Japan, a nation whom we've played seven times. Most recently, like America, in last year's World Cup, where we won 2-0. Uh, that was in our final group game in Nice. As I mentioned, we played Japan in last year's She Believes. And as I mentioned, we also played Japan in last year's She Believes. Now, our first ever meeting with Japan was in 1981 in a tournament called Portopia. Now, that was to celebrate the city of Kobe. We won 4-0. Other invited teams to that little tournament included Italy and Denmark. It's a little history lesson, this, isn't it? And the 11th of March, Spain are the opposition in the Toyota Stadium Frisco, which is in Texas. 20,500 capacity there. Again, soccer specific, and it's home to FC Dallas and previously known as the Pizza Hut Park. <laughs> like Japan, we have a good record against Spain. Played them 13 times, win seven, drawn five, and we've only lost once. And like America and Japan, we also played Spain last year in 2019. A friendly in April at Swindon's County Ground. Goals from Beth Mead and Ellen White saw the girls win 2-1 in front of 13,500. And we've met Spain in both World Cup and European Championship qualifying over the years. But the first time we ever played them was a nil-nil draw back in 1993. Now, if you're looking to watch the games, they are all on the BBC. But at various times, you may need to set yourself an alarm, especially if you're heading to work the following day. Thursday, the 6th of March, it's UK time, 12 a.m., US time 7pm is when we play America and that's going to be screened on BBC Two. Sunday the 8th of March, UK time 7.15 in the evening, Japan against England as BBC Four. And on Wednesday the 11th of March, England against Spain, 10.15 in the evening UK time, again on BBC Four, kickoff in America, 4.15 in the afternoon. So let's take a look at that squad for the She Believes Cup. This is the final competitive squad that Phil Neville will announce before the one he announces for Euro 2021, which we're hosting here in England. He has chosen 23 Lionesses to go to the States. Let's start with the goalkeepers, Ellie Roebuck, Manchester City, Carly Telford of Chelsea, Sandy McIver of Everton. Now she's worked her way up through the England ranks from under 17 to under 21. And interestingly, as of the squad announcement, has only played two WSL matches for Everton. Previously to that, she had been in America for college side Clemson Tigers. In defence, Millie Bright. She missed out on last year's She Believes Cup, but she's back in the squad for this one. Steph Horton from Manchester City, 117 caps to her name, and will undoubtedly add to that tally as captain of the side. Alex Greenwood is in, Demi Stokes, Abby McManus, Rachel Daly from Houston Dash, Grace Fisk from West Ham United. 22 years old, like Sandy McIver, is uncapped, but has worked her way up through the England ranks as well. Like uh, Sandy, spending time in America. Arsenal's Leah Williamson in as well. Midfielders, Jill Scott. Oh, she's a shoe in isn't she? England's most capped player, male or female. Likely to add to her 146 caps, possibly add to her 25 goals as well. Jordan Nobbs of Arsenal back in the squad after missing the World Cup. 
Kira Walsh, Manchester City is in. Lucy Staniforth is in. And up front, Tony Duggan of Atletico Madrid. Nikita Paris, uh, who incidentally will be celebrating her birthday. Uh, she will turn 26 whilst out in America on uh, the 10th of March. Ellen White. Hopefully she can add to her 35 goals with her famous celebration. Georgia Stanway of Manchester City. Bethany England. Only five lioness caps to her name. Will she add to those? We'll find out. Chloe Kelly, 22 years old. Her one and only cap came back in 2018 in a win over Austria, but she's been doing well for Everton recently. And Lauren Hemp of Manchester City, the youngest of the squad. 19 years old. She's played three times. She did go to She Believes 2019 last time. She went to train and be part of the environment, but not part of the squad. This time, she's in. But like Lauren Hemp last time around, Birmingham City goalkeeper Hannah Hampton and striker Alessio Russo, who plays for North Carolina Tar Heels, will join the squad for training sessions in the States as part of their ongoing development. Now, Phil Neville announced that this is an exciting moment for the England women's team, adding with eight of our squad under the age of 23, we're focusing on developing the incredible young talent we have in the women's game, who have a keen eye on Euro 21 in 16 months' time. Now, the squad breaks down as follows. It is dominated by Manchester City players, eight of them. There's three from Chelsea and three from Lyon, two from Everton and Arsenal and one each from Manchester United, Houston Dash, West Ham, Birmingham City and Atletico Madrid. Whilst Phil mentions about eight of them being under 23, the average age of the squad is actually 25.6. But it is still very experienced with 907 caps between them and 138 goals. Of course, it is Steph Horton and Jill Scott with three figure caps to their name, which, uh, which kind of bump that caps total up. Unfortunately, there are some players that have missed out and they include Mary Earps of Manchester United. She may feel a little hard done by to be left out, but Phil Neville has chosen Carly Telford instead. Beth Mead was injured in a recent game for Arsenal against Liverpool. Jodie Taylor over in the States for Rain FC. Doesn't look like she's featured for them since last year. Gemma Bonner of Manchester City doesn't make the cut. Uh, And Frank Kirby has been absent for Chelsea uh, for a little while while suffering from pericarditis. Now, Rich Laverty is our regular Lionesses contributor. Let's hear what he has to say about the squad and England's chances. It's time to welcome back to the Three Lions podcast, Rich Laverty. Hello there. Hi, Russell. Been a while. I think it was last year since we last spoke. Yeah, it's about the longest break you get in international football over uh, Christmas. So, I guess so. It would have been, I guess, by the time the uh, America game comes round in She Believes, it'll almost be four months since the, I guess, the Germany and the Czech Republic games were, yeah. were played. What do you think he's learned in that time, Phil Neville? A lot, hopefully. Yeah, I think obviously the biggest issue we had towards the end of last year and was defending. You know, we were we were conceding too many goals. We were conceding too many goals from crosses, particularly um, set pieces. Just generally not dealing with balls that came into the box. So, and that was a common theme. You know, almost every single game we were playing, we were conceding from crosses and. Even then against the Czech Republic, I can't remember the goals too much, but you know we only went away with a 3-2 win against a much lower-ranked team, so it has to get better. Um, and, you know, this is the perfect chance because, yes, they're glorified friendly somewhat, but, you know, you're playing the world champions first up next week, you know, and that's the ultimate test, and then that shows you where you are because, look, it's not technically a big year for England, but it's a big year for, for Phil because, you know, we've got Team GB and, and the Olympics, of course, coming up. Yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll get on to that in a moment. I mean, you mentioned defending. The squad he's picked, and, and likewise, we'll get on to, to that in a little bit more depth. But it's it's pretty much the same players 
um, like defensive wise that would have been in those last few squads, your Millie Bryant, your Lucy Bronze, uh, Steph Horton and Alex Greenwood, etc. I mean, what what would they have worked on with those players that know the the same routine, I guess? Yeah, we'll find that out until the game. Obviously, they won't have been on camp with each other since November, but I, I never expect too much of a change in personnel, if I'm being honest. I mean, I have this discussion, argument, whatever you want to call it, with fans every time there's a squad announcement and people say, you know, you ought to pick the best 23 players, the 23 players that are on, in the best form, but it doesn't work like that. It's never worked like that with international football, not with Phil, not with Mark Sampson, not with Hope Powell. And I see a lot of people saying, you know, we should hire Jill Ellis. Jill Ellis did the exact same thing with the USA and every international manager does because you need some continuity. You know, it's like having a, a squad, except you only see them once every three or four months. You don't want to change it all the time. You know, the players that maybe were in form back in November and not in form now. And maybe you've got players that are in form now that weren't in November. But you, but you can't build a, a side and an, an 11, a coherent 11 anyway, if you're changing the squad every three or four months. You know, So it doesn't surprise me that there's not major changes. I think Phil has settled on his core. He's brought the youngsters in. You know, Grace Fisk is in, Sandy McIver's in, Lauren Hemp's in, Ellie Roebuck's in. There's a couple more training with the team. And, and I think that is Phil's outlook now that he's got his core of 18 19 players you know based around obviously the odd injury as well frank kirby's not available um beth mead's not available and you know and and then it's up to the youngsters to break their way in look we've probably skipped a group unfortunately with the whole next gen thing a few years ago the under 23s it never really happened so we've probably misused a lot of players your Gemma bonners your jilly flarties your mel lawley's players like that that never really happened for them with England but it doesn't surprise me that it's the same players because that's who he's worked with now you know he knows Steph Horton inside out he knows Millie Bright inside out and whatever their form for club is it doesn't really have as big an effect as I think people either believe it does or want it to it's about much more than that and you know Phil is trying to build a team and, and to do that he needs some consistency I'm I'm quite happy with the squad. I think it's it's the right set of players. I like the fact that there is this young group of players coming up together that have been together for a few years now um, that are working their way into the squad as well. And he's got a strong squad, so it's up to him now to to find a way to make them successful. Yeah, it's it's a lot of trust and a lot of faith, I guess, that he's he's built up over his his period of time at being at the helm. I guess, which is uh, it was reflected in the the players that he's picked. It is, yeah. I mean, the the thing is, you know, it shows we've got a pathway. You know, like I said, we've probably skipped a group, unfortunately. I think we got it wrong with, with the next-gen setup. It didn't really work. But, you know, the, the likes of Fisk and McIver and Roebuck and, and Alessia Russo, who's training with the squad, you know, they went to a World Cup together in 2016, you know, an under-17 World Cup. They went to uh, an under-20 World Cup two years ago and, and won a bronze medal and, They've come, they, they've come through together since they were 14, 15, 16 years old. And, you know, there's five or six of them that have now worked their way into the squad. And, and that shows we're doing something right. And they're exceptional talents, every single one of them. You know, and obviously the ones in the group just in front, the likes of Stanway and, and Kira Walsh and Leah Williamson, who have still got massive England futures ahead of them. So I think it's actually pretty exciting times, to be honest with you. I, I want to touch on the, the goalkeeping situation. Um, it's, you've mentioned there that Sandy McIver has come in and, and she's uncapped at the moment. Ellie Roebuck's only got four caps to her name. Carly Telford has got, what, 24, 25 caps. She made her debut back in 2007. I don't want to say like the, a bit player, but she's kind of come in as and when needed. But where, where do you think Phil is putting his faith in for this tournament and long term? And can, can Mary Earps feel a little bit irked as she's not been picked? She can. Again, it comes back a little bit to what I said about the fact that there's a lot more that goes into it than just form. And again, that's an argument I had, you know, when the squad was announced with, with Manchester United fans and fans of other clubs who thought their players should have been in. But, you know, Phil was quite open at his press conference. He said there was always a plan for this camp to pick Ellie and Sandy, the two young goalkeepers. He said 
all along, whenever we've mentioned goalkeepers during his tenure so far, Ellie and Sandy are always the two he mentions as the future, as the future number ones, the, the ones that will compete for the number one shirt. And he said, look, when I knew I was going to pick those two, I needed my third goalkeeper to be experienced. And look, Mary's not inexperienced, but Carly is into her 30s. She's been around a long time. You know, let's not forget, she's played actually a lot of games for England under Phil Neville, certainly more than she'd ever played under any other manager. She played the World Cup semi-final against the USA. She is, with Karen Bardsley injured still, the most experienced goalkeeper we've got. And that's what bugs me a little bit. People are very quick to say, oh, why's Mary been dropped? Why is she not in? You know, she's done this, she's done that. There's always a reason. There's mm. always, it's not a case of Mary Ups is now rubbish and never going to get picked again. Oh, no. You know, he's brought two young girls. They're friendlies at the end of the day. And, and again, it, it, that's why it doesn't have to be the best 23 players. You know, we're on a development pathway now. We've got a European Championships in our own country in 18 months. And the likes of Grace Fisk and Lauren Hemp and Alessia Russo and, and Sandy McCann, they're, they're probably all going to be a part of that. So even if they are playing college football at the moment or they're not playing every week in the WSL, it's important from an England point of view that they're in the squad now and getting used to the international setup. And look, yes, there's some players that will be sat at home thinking, I should be going to She Believes, but, you know, it's tough. That That's international football. You know, it, it's how it is. And you have to think about, you know, it's not like club football where you're thinking about what's going to happen next week or, or this coming Sunday. In international football, you've got to be thinking two years ahead. You know, so yeah, it's harsh on Mary, it's harsh on Gemma Bonner and, and a few others that are not in the squad, but, you know, that's how it is. And they're the youngsters coming through and they're the ones that now are almost the priority and, and people just have to, to get on with it. Yeah. This particular tournament, there's a, a hell of a lot of travelling that's going to be involved going from Orlando to Harrison to, to Frisco. Do you think that's going to be a, a contributing factor in in anything? Uh, I mean, NWSL teams do that every week, don't they, in America? Well, but it's true, yes. It's, um, yeah, I'm not sure why they've put a game out in Texas, if I'm being honest with you, because it has primarily been on the East Coast um, ever since she believes has, has been in existence. And obviously, they get two of the games are on the East Coast this year. So it's not ideal. To be honest with you, I wonder where the future is for She Believes. I sort of feel like it's it's almost had its day already. There's this new tournament now in France that's happening next month that's got France in it, uh, Brazil, Netherlands, Canada. and Actually, on paper, you look at it and think it's just as strong as She Believes. And you've got the Algarve Cup as well down in Portugal, which is always a strong lineup. And I think, I'm not really sure what England, are, you know, in, in the middle of a busy domestic season where you've got a backlog of games going on as well at the minute with all the postponements. You go straight into the Olympics, or not straight into the Olympics, but you go into the Olympics, you then come out of that straight into a new season, and then obviously we'll be straight into the European Championship next year. So there's not much of a break. And I've heard rumours that possibly in April, maybe there won't be any games, and it'll be more a camp, um, maybe one game. I'm not sure that rather than the usual two. So maybe that's to compensate for this. But I do wonder why England are, are sort of persisting going all the way to America and travelling around America now when they could go to, you know, Portugal or even, you know, maybe next year an option is literally to go to France. You know, the games in in this new French tournament are in the northeast, um, around Valenciennes, where, you know, it's it's probably about an extra hour and a half from London, to be honest with you, yeah. if you're on the if you're on the train. So it's not exactly the furthest um, away and, and you're still getting three incredibly competitive matches. So I don't know if it's marketing or, or England are contracted into that now, but it's not ideal. I don't, I don't think it has a massive effect, but I think just as a whole, with France having now pulled out, Germany pulled out, you know, Brazil did it for one year, I think. Are there other tournaments now possibly overtaking She Believes? And uh, I think we'll probably see in the next few years whether that's true or not. Yeah. Oh, well, watch this space. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you make of the other three teams? We've got the uh, the hosts, America, and we've got Japan and Spain. Uh, we've both, all three that we've played in 2019. So they're, they're not really new to us, are they? No, I don't think you could ever really play new teams in international football anymore, no. can you? Unless you want to go way down the rankings. I think you can probably look at any of the top 20 and 
apart from probably North Korea, um, mm-hmm. England, England will have played them at some point in the last few years. So they're not new tests. And it, it's about, like I said, it, it's kind of a new cycle now for England. And I, I want to see these players tested. You know, we've said for a long, you know, Ellie Roebuck's been around the squads for quite a while now, but never really played the big games. You know, same for maybe George Stanway, the same for Lauren Hemp and Leah Williamson. You know, they've been put in against, you know, the lower ranked teams or they might get five minutes here and there, but it's not really a token gesture for them now. You know, Ellie Roebuck is debatable, the number one now for England. You know, she's the number one for Man City. She has been for some time. Leah Williamson's played regularly for Arsenal for the last five, six years now. Georgia Stanway is, you know, scoring goals for fun for Manchester City. And I'd like to see them actually play now against the US. You know, I'd like to see Ellie Rowe booking goal against the US. I'd like to see Leah Williamson in defence because I think they're actually there now. You know, it's not a case of, oh, they're young. We've got to bed them in. I think they're actually deserving of their spot in these games. So... That's the good thing about She Believes. You know, if they all do get a game at some point, they will be playing, you know, tough opposition. And, you know, the US being up first is is interesting. Obviously, they beat, beat us in the World Cup. They've got a new manager. They're as strong as ever. You know, it will be the ultimate test of where England are. Japan, I hope they're bringing their full squad. I think they will. They, they took a very different approach to She Believes last year. And they kind of did what we're doing now. You know, they were 18 months out at that point from their home home Olympics. And they took a very young squad, you know, a, a squad of players they wanted to develop over the next 18 months, which is basically what we're doing now with an eye to the Euros. So mm. Japan were a little bit off the pace last year at She Believes. Maybe that will happen to us. I don't know. But I'd be interested to see where they're at now, 12 months on, and seeing where, where they're at in their development, because obviously for them, it's all about Tokyo. You know, they've got to succeed in front of their home fans. And, and Spain, obviously, new team, but they play great football. You know, I love watching any Spanish team. Um, I enjoyed watching them at the World Cup. They gave the US a really good game. So, yeah, look, England going to have to be on it. But I'd still rather see the young players. You know, I, I want to see Roebuck and Williamson and and Hemp and Stanway and even Fisk could get games because at the end of the day, if you get beat, if they make errors, it doesn't matter. You know, I'd rather see them make errors now than, than in the Olympics or at the Euros. You know, they're going to have to learn from it if they do. But at the end of the day, if you make them as she believes, it's not the end of the world. We've got to start not just calling them up, not just using it as a token gesture to, to get used to being in the squad. Give them some game time now. You know, if, if we don't see Ellie Roebuck in goal against the US... I'd be quite disappointed, actually, because I think she's earned that right, first and foremost, but I think she also needs it. She needs that test. So I think it'd be a really interesting tournament, actually. I don't think it's necessarily about winning it. If we win it, great. But I think I think there's a much bigger story there now for England and, and one that will go on for the next 18 months now leading up to the Euros. Yeah. Um, and Bethany England, can we expect her to be a, a regular now? Yeah, she's another one, you know, that completely escaped me there when I was co- I was going through the youngsters. But, yeah, Beth's another one, you know. All right, you've got Ellen White in there, but Beth probably is the best striker we've got right now. You know, she's absolutely on fire. Start her against the US. You know, don't put her on the bench. Put her up against Becky Sauerbrunn and, and Abby Dahlkemper and Julia. Urch, you know, give her that test. It's what she needs. It's not a case of, oh, she's young or, you know, she's still relatively new to the squad. She's the top striker, top English striker in the WSL at the minute. She's got more goals than Ellen White. She's playing better than Ellen White. So let's see what she can do. You know, she's going to be an England number nine if she carries on this form for the next 10 years. So, yeah, again, Beth's another one I want to see in that team against the US. I want to see Roebuck. I want to see Williamson. I want to see Beth England. I'd certainly want to see Lauren Hemp at some point. I think it's a big tournament for her with Beth Mead being out injured as well. You know, we've never had a kind of natural left footer out on that left wing for England, not for a long, long time. Um, And again, Hemp's another one. She's been one of Man City's best players this season. You know, it's not a token gesture to play her now. She's in absolutely fantastic form. So I think Phil has the opportunity and the potential to learn a lot about his players, his young players in this tournament. Yes, for your likes of Grace Fisk and Sandy McIver, it's a little bit different. You know, maybe I'd like to see them come on 
maybe in a game against possibly Spain, possibly Japan. I wouldn't throw them straight in yeah. against the US, absolutely not. But the others that have been there a while now and are playing well in the WSL, I, I really want to see them against the US. And I think there's nothing to lose by doing it. You know, We need to develop them because if they go to the Olympics or they go to the Euros, they're going to come up against the US at the Olympics at some point. If they want to win it, they're going to come up against France and Germany if they want to win the Euros. And, you know, give them that experience now. Don't put them straight into it when it's everything to lose. Put them in it when it's nothing to lose. Yeah, well, well, you mentioned it there. Phil Neville doesn't want to talk about it, does he? The Olympics, the players, they're going to have an eye on that as well, aren't they? Surely. Yeah, I don't think they can help it but think about it. Look, Phil will be thinking about it. He's not going to talk about it, but he'll be thinking about it. Of course he will. You know, he's got probably the toughest job that he'll ever get. You know, I think even if it was just England, the fact that you can only take 18 players is horrendous, really, because straight away you have to drop five players from your World Cup squad. But you take into account, then obviously, the likes of Roebuck and, and England and Hemp and, you know... Fisk have come into the squad since then. Actually, you think with the Welsh players, the Scottish players, not he could be dropping half of his World Cup squad, you know, because he will take Scottish players, he will take Welsh players. Whether he takes Northern Irish players, I don't know. But you look at their teams. You look at Kim Little, Caroline Weir, Erin Cuthbert, Jem Beatty, Rachel Causey. You know, with Wales, you've got Jess Fishlock, Sophie Ingle, Haley Ladd. You know, absolute quality players, which which would improve the England team. So, I mean, we've all tried doing it. I think fans mm-hmm. have tried doing it. We've all tried picking our 18s, and it's absolutely an impossible job, you know. So, he'll be thinking about it. It is literally the hardest decision I think he'll have to make because he's going to leave out some absolutely quality players, some absolute quality players. So, yeah, I think whenever that squad announcement comes around, I'm not sure when it's going to be, I think it'll be one of the most intriguing squad announcements we've ever had in women's football because most squad announcements these days you go into it and you probably know most of the squad, if I'm being honest. But now it's really, really difficult. I mean, I don't know if I've asked you this before, but in the men's game or the men's Olympic squad, doesn't it, isn't it an age cap of, of 23 and you can have three overage players? Um, is that is that the same in the women's squad? No, I think it's open in the women's. Um, right. So he can pick whoever he wants, basically. Oh, um, I think the only stipulation is it's two goalkeepers instead of three, um, and then the rest are outfield players. Okay. Well, we shall uh, obviously we'll talk about that nearer the time as and when it as and when it comes around. But but she believes. Have you? Uh, are you going? No, I'm not going out there. It's what you said earlier, I think logistically it's a bit of a nightmare. So, um, no, giving it a swerve at the minute. There'll be a few of my colleagues out there. And, yeah, I'll be following along from home. The the games don't seem to be too unsociable, apart from the first one, which is, yes. I think, midnight UK time. So, I think the other two are 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock or something. So, they're actually really good times to sit at home and uh, watch on the TV. Well. Wow. Let's, uh, yeah, I will be watching along with you. Interesting way that you put it to say it's not essential that we that we win it, but just more the more the performances that are put in and, and what we can take from that, I guess. Definitely, yeah. You know, like I said, this is a squad that's changing now. You know, there is a, a look to the future and I think a look to Euro 2021. I think every decision he's made, you know, bringing those youngsters in is looking towards Euro 2021, so... That's still 18 months away, so I think for now it is definitely about development. Great stuff. Well, we'll uh, we shall catch up again soon. I guess when that next squad uh, or the next camp comes round, which you say is April time. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Well, we shall we shall speak again then. Rich Laverty, thank you very much. Not a problem. Thanks to Rich Laverty there. You can follow him on Twitter at Rich J Laverty for all the latest on the women's game. And I'm sure he'll be very active come She Believes. Now, like Rich, many of us will have to do with watching the games on the telly. 
But what is it actually like to go to She Believes and experience it live? Well, here we speak with a Lionesses fan who has been to all the previous editions. I'd like to welcome to the Three Lions podcast ahead of the She Believes Cup in next month, Jess Scully, Lioness's supporter who has previously been to the She Believes Cup and is here to tell us all about it. Jess, hello. Yeah, I went to all four She Believes Cups so far. Unfortunately, not going to make it this year, but it is an amazing experience. The one thing to remember is it is all geared to the home fans. Yeah, I don't think they expect visitors from uh, supporters of the other teams, but don't let that put you off going. And, and you will see some great American cities and the stadium are just incredible. That first She Believes Cup that you went to, was it? Yes. Well, I mean, obviously it's grown in, in stature. Very much so. Cause yeah, the first She Believes in 2016, I remember the last game day was played on a university pitch in... Uh, city in Florida called Boca Raton and uh, the stadium there was really pretty basic compared to the others and the pitch was a sand pit so thankfully the tournament has evolved since then uh, and, and we, we use uh, NFL stadiums mostly and it is just amazing. What, what's the the atmosphere like over there? Because the, obviously the, the American women's soccer I think it'd be safe to say is is grown quicker than the the men's soccer um, and has got a lot more followers what's what's the atmosphere like over there uh, yeah as you say women's football is massive in the states their national team team have just been the best in the world for the last 20 years really and they do have some very fervent fans you have a fan group called the american outlaws who they sing and chant non-stop all game it's quite something to hear you say this is not so many Oh, away supporters make the make the journey. That's uh, absolutely correct. Uh, I know at uh, she believes one, two, three, four, or uh, I was at uh, each time one of a group of I think three or four supporters who came over from England each time. Although we did make some friends over there each time. There was uh, a local in Philadelphia last year who was lending his support to the Lionesses because he was a Sheffield Wednesday fan. Then. Um, Similarly, in New Jersey at She Believes 3, we met the uh, New York Blackburn Rovers Supporters Club, although that they were Americans, but it's uh, always great to find friends over there. Oh, wow. So it's a re- really good chance to, to meet friends and as well, I guess, to, to see parts of America that you may not necessarily think about visiting. That's right. If I hadn't been a Lionesses fan, I'd never have visited iconic cities like Philadelphia, Orlando. So, yeah, I've a lot to thank the She Believes Cup for. How, how did following the Lionesses come about? Uh, yeah, I became a women's football fan in 1998 when, uh, on a whim, I popped down to Millwall to see the Lionesses play Germany. So, I've uh, had an interest in women's football since then. I kind of became a fervent fan of the Lionesses going to most games at home and away. That would be probably late 2014. I mean, I've known Jodie Taylor for ages, so oh, seeing her play was a bit of an attraction. And uh, I think where I'd kind of lost interest in professional men's football and uh, was gravitating more towards non-league, I decided to uh, to pursue my interest in the women's game, which I thought would offer a much more palatable football supporting experience than it has. Because in Canada, 2015 World Cup, I met her some real hardcore Lionesses fans. They are ultras and uh, they're known as the gang and uh, you couldn't wish for a nicer bunch of people and that they welcomed me into their family as it were in Canada and I've been hanging out with them at England Games ever since. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Excellent. Looking forward to to 2020, how do you see um, the Lionesses progressing? Because we had a bit of uh, an up and down end of last, last year, didn't we? That's right. Out of the last eight games, we've won only two, if I remember rightly. And I do have my doubts about Mr Neville, but I'm not going to expand on that because he is the coach in place. And uh, we, we do have a great bunch of players. So I'm hoping the Lionesses will come good. The incentive to defend the trophy will be 
enormous. That should give them a spur, as she believes. Although, as always, the USA will be the team to be. And of course, as having qualified as host for the Euros, this is our only taste of tournament football. This and next year. Dad, I wouldn't be surprised if Phil Neville bloods some new players over the next year or so, where we have only she believes is and friendlies to play for a year and a bit. So I think he might experiment and get some of the younger lasses from the next gen and from the WSL young prospects in for a game or two. And I guess as well, he's got to look forward to the Olympics as well, hasn't he? He's got one eye on that. Of course, yes. Uh, it's uh, it, interesting that we hit last half an Olympic team again since uh, 2012. And uh, the, of course, the question is whether or any non-England players will make the grade. I mean, Kim Little is certainly world-class. Jess Fishlock is certainly world-class. But um, again, there's are only 18 spots, so it's going to be a bit of a headache for him. Is the Team GB a team that you, you take an interest in? I'll be watching the games on the telly, but... Um, I won't be as fervent a fan as I am of the England team. Uh, it's simply because I'm a passionate advocate of retaining our four separate national teams, but I'll be watching and hoping they do well. Yeah. And there's there's other teams there. I mean, Japan would play before the States. Obviously, we've got a uh, uh, quite a, uh, I'd say, record against them, but it's not a particularly good record against them. But we've got Spain in it as well. That's right. Spain will be interesting debutants. They are an attractive side. They were narrowly edged by the USA in the World Cup, so they'll be out for revenge. Yeah, we're in for a very interesting tournament. And of course, the games are, I think, if I'm right in saying one is about seven in the evening uh, uh, UK time, but another one is, is midnight time, isn't it? So there's some late nights. There's a couple at seven in the evening. There's one at midnight, but yeah, it's uh, worth staying up for, believe me. Uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, very best of luck to our Lionesses in the States. And uh, any England fans, if you're thinking of going over and you can afford it and you can get the time off work, do it. It's uh, got, got to be tempting, surely. As I said, just be prepared for the host, not expecting many away fans. And so, uh, because uh, on the merchandise stores, there are some general She Believes Cup t shirts, even though they've got USA on and all the rest is US national team. But uh, you'll, you'll meet some friendly people over there. Uh, uh, you'll uh, visit some fantastic stadiums. So uh, uh, if you can go, go. Wish I was joining you. Give them a cheer for me. Think we can retain it? I would honestly say I will predict that the USA will win. In their tails are up as well, champions. They're still always the team to beat. But uh, uh, I hope the Lionesses prove me wrong and uh, come with the trophy and go home with it. Jess Cully, thank you very much for joining us on the Three Lions podcast. Thank you. Thanks to Jess Cully there for his insight into what it's like to go to the States and watch the She Believes. So... Last year, I began the task of putting together an online database of all the Lionesses' results over the years. It's still not complete and is an ongoing project, and I'm continually looking for old results and old programmes to fill in the gaps. It is frustrating as all the senior men's results can be found online dating back to 1872, and they can all be found on englandfootballonline.com. And I'm pleased to announce that I've teamed up with Glenn Isherwood and Chris Goodwin by adding the England ladies, or more recently known as the Lionesses, their results to their database. It's going to be on englandfootballonline.com. As it puts basically the senior women together with the senior men, all in one handy place. And you can still find this via englandlionesses.com or You can just follow the links on englandfootballonline.com. You may remember in the past we've spoken with Glenn Isherwood on the podcast and you can find that episode on threelinespodcast.com. I'm looking forward to working with Chris and Glenn and hopefully three heads can gather more information quicker than just my little one. And who knows where it can go in the future. So keep your eyes on englandfootballonline.com or as I say, englandlionesses.com.
And that pretty much wraps up this episode, the She Believes preview episode. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. Thank you very much to Rich Laverty. Thank you very much to Jess Cully too. We'll be back after the tournament with a look back on how it went, along with the details on the Nations League draw that is due to take place on March the 3rd for the senior men. As I mentioned, all previous episodes of the Three Lions podcast can be found at threelionspodcast.com. Head over there, take a listen to any that you may have missed. We're also on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram as well when I remember to to post on there. And if you would like to leave me a nice review, always welcome to receive those, then you can do that by your uh, by your favourite podcast provider, iTunes and the like. So until the next time... Cheers.